Okay, now I get to start acting like the president. So um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, our convocation speaker, Dr. Imani Perry. Dr. Perry is the Hughes Rogers Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. She's the author of the books More Beautiful and More Terrible, The Embrace and Transcendence of Racial Inequality in the United States, and Prophets of the Hood, Politics and Poetics in Hip Hop. She's also authored numerous articles in law, cultural studies, and African American studies. She has two forthcoming books. One explores the history of the Black National Anthem. The second looks at gender, neoliberalism, and the digital age. At Princeton, Dr. Perry teaches race and the American legal process, master, law, law, social policy, and African American women, masters of the 20th century, Lorraine Hansberry as well. She has affiliations with Princeton's Law and Public Affairs Program and its program in Gender and Sexuality Studies. On a personal note, Imani's grace, authority, and presence have inspired me since we were colleagues back at Rutgers years ago. Please welcome my friend and colleague, Professor Imani Perry. Good morning. It is with um, enormous pleasure that I join you today for the inauguration of Dr. Elizabeth Hillman as the president of Mills College. Um, as she said, we began our academic careers together at Rutgers School of Law in Camden. She'd been there a year before I came, um, and she was an immediate source of kindness, humor, integrity, sincerity, and friendship during my years there. We both departed and experienced various transformations in our lives as life goes, and years have intervened. We haven't seen each other. Um, and yet, when I received this invitation, I immediately agreed to come across the country for 24 hours um, <laughs> at one of the busiest times of my year uh, and my children's year. And I did so because um, I know Beth to be someone of such exceptional character in addition to her brilliance, that for me, it is truly an honor to witness this per turning point in her life and in the life of this extraordinary institution. So my talk today um, was spurred in part by a quotation from a writer um, who I'm currently researching. Um, and it's, I had the great pleasure to meet one of your Board of Trustees members, uh, Margaret Wilkerson, who is the, um, the essential Lorraine Hansberry scholar. So I hope I don't say anything wrong about her today. Um, but I, wanted, I was spurred on by a quote by Lorraine Hansberry. I'm sure most of you are familiar with um, one, at least one of her works, A Raisin in the Sun. She was a ground rate, groundbreaking uh, black woman play, playwright, born in 1930, lived a complex and beautiful and short life, dying of pancreatic cancer at age 34. Um, she traveled as an activist for peace to Uruguay. She's one of the people who facilitated the Kenyan airlift that our president's father came to the United States on. She wrote essays, articles, plays, and poems, and was deeply connected to some of the most impactful artists and thinkers of the 1950s. Um, she was passionate and brilliant as an activist and as an intellectual as well as an artist. And so, um, as you can tell, I adore her. She is a heroine of mine. But she has this one quote that kind of bugs me. Um, so I know you expected me to say something inspirational that she said. But this actually, this quote got, gets under my skin. Um, and it's this. She said, eventually it comes to you, the thing that makes you exceptional, if you are at all, is inevitably that which must also make you lonely. And the quote bothers me not because of the description of loneliness. Loneliness is an unavoidable part of the human experience. In fact, in moderation, it is a gift a reminder of the preciousness of human connection and intimacy in their absence, a necessary opportunity for reflection during which we access our deepest recesses, our hurt, our questions, our doubts. I understand loneliness, but I have trouble with, the, with an idea of exceptionalism as a marker of excellence and importance. It is an idea of relation with others in which you are the exception to the rule. Now, the word extraordinary, which is part of my title, can be, can be used in the same way, but it doesn't quite have to mean that. Because what it means at its root 
is being in excess of the ordinary, reaching beyond the ordinary, and that's not necessarily exclusive. Extraordinariness is, in a fundamental sense, potentially democratic, and it is the stuff of dreamers. I like to think of the extraordinary in everyone. So, uh, why quibble over the definitions and sensibilities of these two words? Part of the answer is that Lorraine Hansberry received a D in drama in high school. And her other grades weren't outstanding. She attended the University of Wisconsin. She became a student activist. She dropped out. She studied painting at the University of Guadalajara and found out she, that wasn't her calling. She wasn't exceptionally good at painting. She attended Roosevelt University in Chicago, um, entered on academic probation, studied one, studied, took, a, start, took sort of a half a semester of a German course before leaving. Um, so the, thing that the things that carried her from being someone who struggled and who likely wasn't seen as exceptional to becoming one of the greatest playwrights in American history to being extraordinary is my concern today. In order to maintain resilience in the face of defeat, failure and disappointment and heartbreak, such that you meet the possibilities of life fully nonetheless, you must believe that you are enough and not too much. The size of your hopes and your thighs, your scars and your questions are not too much. You must take up space in more ways than one. You are enough even if you are worrying right at this moment how you're going to buy all the course books. You are enough even if you have been abused and assaulted. You are enough even if you don't understand all of the words people are saying in class. You are enough even if you have or had a 1.0 GPA. You are enough because you're here ready to both be here and become here, to be a flesh and blood testament to the beauty of life and in life. The best ministry of this message that I've ever read was in the voice of a character in Toni Morrison's beloved, Baby Suggs, uh, a formerly enslaved woman, elderly woman, who in a clearing in the forest preached to the formerly enslaved who were now in Ohio. She says, in this here place, we flesh, flesh that weeps, laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet in grass, love it, love it hard. Yonder, they don't love your flesh. They despise it. No more do they love the skin on your back. Yonder, they flay it. And oh, my people, they do not love your hands. Those they only use, tie, bind, chop off, and leave empty. Love your hands. Love them. Raise them up and kiss them. Touch others with them. Pat them together. Stroke them on your face, because they don't love that either. You got to love it, you. And no, they ain't in love with your mouth. Yonder out there, they will see it broken and break it again. What you say out of it, they will not heed. What you put into it to nourish your body, they will snatch away and give leavings instead. No, they don't love your mouth. You got to love it. This is flesh I'm talking about here. Flesh that needs to be loved. Feet that need to rest and to dance. Backs that need support. Shoulders that need arms, strong arms. I'm telling you, and oh my people out yonder, hear me. They do not love your neck unnoosed and straight. So love your neck. Put a hand on it. Grace it, stroke it, and hold it up. And all your inside part that they just as soon as slop for hogs. You got to love them too. The mandate is one about self-possession and self-love. I find it useful to read Baby Suggs alongside the work of the late brilliant feminist scholar Gloria Anzaldúa, who said, we are taught that the body is an ignorant animal, intelligence dwells only in the head, but the body is smart. It does not discern between external stimuli and stimuli from the imagination. It reacts equally viscerally to events from the imagination as it does to real events. The beaten and enslaved and diminished and devalued body can also be rendered beautiful and valuable through our care and imaginations. If we are passionately human and no less divine, to borrow a phrase from my colleague Wallace Best, who are we to insult 
the shapes and movements of our flesh, the speeds of our brains, the truth of our desire, the angles of our teeth. Anzaldúa was uh, disabled by a severe endocrine disorder from birth. Hansberry died young from pancreatic cancer. Their bodies were medically deficient, but sources of greatness. As someone who has suffers from several chronic disease disabilities myself, it means so much to see my body as the potential source of something great instead of as something failing. We are all enough and never too much. When we talk about the idea of equality or justice in our society and world, often we are also talking about reaching towards a radical acceptance of each other, of the fundamental common state of the human condition, one that rejects the idea that the accident of where and to whom I was born and how I was born makes me better or lesser. Radical acceptance of the commonality of our human condition makes bigotry untenable. It makes me know that the fact that I was born on one side of an arbitrary geographical line doesn't make me any more valuable than someone born on the other side. I believe Anzaldúa's words when she said, borders are set up to define the places that are safe and unsafe to distinguish us from them. A border is a dividing line, a narrow strip along a steep edge. Whatever your beliefs are politically, I hope you will embrace philosophically the benefit of recognizing humanity across borders and across difference. Once we radically accept one another, we reside on the borders, in the borders to some extent, meeting others at the crossroads. Radical acceptance makes me know that who I find beautiful and desirable uh, in myself, what I find beautiful and desirable in myself and others is not a metric measuring my decency any more than which hand I write with or whether or not I have hands with which to write. Radical acceptance of all of us means we reject the diminishment of any of us it begins with our own individual insides and then outsides and the world around us. And I think one of the most tragic aspects of uh, this society's culture for girls and women, queer and genderqueer and femme people, generally all these groups, is that so much of it entails a ritual proclamation of, I am not enough. And we have to undo that fiction. Remember, once some teacher, several teachers, said that Hansberry wasn't good enough at writing or dramatizing, and I am so glad that she didn't believe them. But then again, maybe she wasn't very good at those things in high school or college classes. And yet she still kept exploring and trying and returned to sites of failure. And there's a lesson there. Leave open the possibility that you might find your footing in endeavors that seem uncomfortable or nearly impossible at first. One of my favorite observations in a memoir written by um, Rita Marley, the widow of Bob Marley, um, in her memoir, she says, everything important that ever happened to me in my life was unexpected. Um, and I agree with that. I, I, I would share that sensibility. And, but in order for that to be true, one has to be open to the unexpected in herself and in others. And that's where we ought to turn to thinking about community. Communities are always interdependent. We're always locked in relationship with others. But that interdependence is not always healthy or good. Sometimes we're locked in relations with our families and communities, cities, nations, that are, in a word, dysfunctional. Um, but what I know of Mills and its traditions, and being here with you all, particularly the current students, you're just extraordinary, um, just beautiful. Um, what I know of Mills and its traditions, and what I, I know of your incoming president, um, you are more than capable of sustaining, protecting, and extending a culture of healthy inter interdependence here. A healthy interdependence allows us to explore, to be vulnerable, to question, falter, and transform. It doesn't cage us, any of us, into narrow boxes. The community is what makes your personal extraordinary possible. It makes space for you, and it witnesses 
who you are and who you become if you're open. Community is the single most important aspect of a college or university's existence. When Lorraine Hansberry finally made her way to New York where she would achieve fame, she began working for a small newspaper titled Freedom, um, started by uh, the famous singer, actor, and activist Paul Robeson. She wrote um, uh, book reviews, film reviews, poems. She took classes um, at the Jefferson School of Social Science, which was sort of a, a fledgling left-wing school with um, uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, known as the father of American sociology, amongst other distinctions. Um, she found people there who would hear her and teach her, help her discipline her ideas, and hold a mirror up to her growth lovingly. Now, for someone to hold a mirror up to your growth is not the same thing as telling you that everything about you is perfect and great. Those types of mirrors are only in fairy tales. Who is the fairest of them all, that kind of mirror? A good mirroring is one in which you receive and are given honest, loving, and respectful reflection, one that will be sincere and kind, if not always accolades. That's with friends and educators and administrators and coworkers and all the loved ones who are on this journey with you. Your communities you, is beyond school, of course. Um, we all belong to multiple communities. But for the students, I'd ask you to be sure that you create at least one, or if you already have it, nurture at least one, that gives you the opportunity to be seen, to be mirrored, to be valued, and to expand. Sometimes that's hard. For all her greatness, Hansberry didn't seem to find a community that fully had space for all of her, though she had many um, people who adored her. She identified as a woman who loved women. She was, on the one hand, part of a community of mostly white, middle-class, lesbian friends in the Greenwich Village on the one side, and then her political activist friends who were focused on anti-colonialism and anti-racism and Marxist politics and civil rights. It doesn't appear that her worlds came together fully. Um, and in that way, you can imagine a deep well of loneliness uh, could have emerged and not feeling fully seen and understood in her various worlds. And perhaps this is why she lived so much in books and ideas and words. And the imagination and the intellect, which while never the same as other people, do pulse with possibility. They shape you. They grow you up. They help us, as James Baldwin famously guided, to go the way our blood beats, even if not everyone around you or not everyone who you love understands. And perhaps that's why um, James Baldwin, who's one of perhaps the greatest essayists in American history, became one of her best friends. He too was often betwixt and between. Perhaps they recognized in each other something even deeper than what they got from larger communities they occupied. Which brings me to my final point, um, which comes from another quote by Gloria Anzaldúa, who once said, Caminante, no hay puentes, se hace puentes al andar. If the bridges aren't there, you build them as you walk. To do so is extraordinary. Anzaldúa, like Hansberry, like Baldwin, used language that made her language, her people take up space, brought her communities together in her work. What others deemed to be their failings became important fonts for their genius. So I've taken a few, a few detours on this path but I hope the journey um, I'm trying to um, reveal is somewhat clear. Come as you are. Revel in who you are. Be in the world and for the world. Be a beacon, build bridges. And as the saying goes, find your tribe and love them hard. Armed with them, your imagination, your passion, and your labors, be extraordinary. Thank you.